This one starts, hello sir, I am a 60 year old male that has been on testosterone sipionate for 30 years. I have in the past stacked the testosterone with other anabolics such as D-ball, Dianabol, Deca, Decadroblin, Winstrol, and Trenbolone. I never stacked more than three of these at one time and never very high dosages. I've had blood work done several times over the years. Most of the times the results came back within acceptable limits acceptable being the key word, I'm sure, <laughs> with the exception of high liver enzymes and high bad cholesterol. I can already tell, based on what we talked about earlier, what do you mean high liver enzymes? I bet you he means AST and ALT, but it doesn't uh, delineate that here. But um, he says, with the exception of high liver enzymes and high bad cholesterol, as expected, he puts in parentheses, at my highest dosages, my free testosterone levels were 4,000 nanograms per deciliter, I assume, which I know are extremely high for quote unquote normal people. Just in my opinion, high, not high for a bodybuilder. What are your thoughts on this? Okay, um, it's actually not that high. I mean, it's higher than we would find with testosterone replacement therapy for sure. But in, in certain patients that I call cheap dates, where they don't metabolize uh, the, the testosterone that quickly, it takes them a while to break down the esters, et cetera. Um, we might see on day two and a half, three after their injection of just 200 milligrams of testosterone sipionate that they might have a, a titer of say 3,800 I've seen before, which you go, oh, come on, you're doing tons. No, you're just, as, as I say, a cheap date. You're just not metabolizing it that quickly. Um, that's not the norm, you know, but it can go into 2000s, certainly over 1500. Um, and you know, with what he says he's taking here, if it's indeed pharmaceutical grade, et cetera, uh, 4,000 is not, not unusual for, again, what he's taken. Um, what, is my, what are my thoughts on that dose? Well, I don't think you need that for, obviously, for replacement therapy. And just to touch on the basics, you know, with testosterone, there's not a sweet spot so much as you got to be a, above a therapeutic minimum. And we've known since the 1950s, roughly that means for the average person, et cetera, all generalities, 800 nanograms per deciliter, but um, uh, you know, so clearly you're above that level, and you got to be that way for the whole week, obviously, with those levels. Um, so I would say you don't need that certainly. Uh, as I touched on very briefly, I'll touch on it again. Liver enzymes. I don't know what that means because elevated AST and ALT. I would expect if you're a well-muscled male using testosterone and/or anabolics. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the liver is generating those those numbers. And then, uh, okay, so he goes on to say, I had a heart attack two years ago. My two main arteries were 80% blocked and required three stents. Since my heart attack, I have still maintained my testosterone sipionate injections at 250 milliliters per week. I'm wanting to add 125 milliliters of Deca Durablin a week to this mainly for joint pain. This would be an ongoing stack with maybe some winstrol added from time to time to lean out. Uh, is this something that you would consider unadvisable because of my past heart problem? Okay, yeah, let's address this. So this is a good question because I, there are people in this boat, right? Um, to get on a, a, a once a week injection of testosterone sipionate, 250, milli, milli, excuse me, 250 milligrams per week is reasonable. Again, without, seeing what your labs do and talking to you and knowing how symptoms resolve, et cetera, it sounds reasonable. Uh, to add 125 milliliters of decadrolin per week, we have studies using, I mean, not to, not to cut hairs here, but we've shown that, that 100 milliliters, sorry, milliliters, 100, he's writing milliliters, I'm reading milligrams, it. Yeah. 100 milligrams of decadrolin per week is fine to treat joint pain. Okay, very safe, at least proven so far by the studies that we have and it does tend to help reduce joint pain, okay? Uh, we talked about this before too. Uh, it works on the pain, it tends to be very safe, and it works well. Uh, would I add Winstrol? Don't choose the messenger, guys and gals. Roughly, anytime over 30, someone asks me about it, I say no. Why? Because Winstrol, also known as Denozolol, is an anabolic steroid that's used, one of the indications, and just because it lists list it as an indication doesn't mean it's what it does I realize that there's a lot of things out there a lot of drugs that you go what but it does get rid of excess water we call the third space water it works on what we call angioedema 
do we need to dry out as we get older? Typically, no. We start out roughly in life at 70% water, and if we make it to, say, 80, we're about roughly 50% water. Wow. We're desiccating as we go along. Dry tendons tend to be injury-prone. And brittle. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I don't recommend it. I mean, look, bodybuilders, if they want to get ready for a show, you know, either Trenbolone Balone or Wenstrol, six to eight weeks out, unless you, you know, are amazing, because in that kind of environment where you're competing to show every bit of what you've trained hard for, you want to get rid of every ounce of, not less than ounces, of third space water you can, so you can see prostrations on your bum, right, in the bodybuilding world. But for us regular Joes, no. Uh, why take the risk? I'd rather you consider something like Anavar or Oxandrolone where you don't have that drying out effect, right? But for this particular gentleman, to come back to this gentleman, because you have heart problems, no. Here's an example where you do have to pay attention to what we do know and what we've been clamoring about, which is true in the case of someone who has extant coronary artery disease. If you lower your LDL, you are better off. You can slow, stop, or even reverse coronary artery disease by getting rid of that bad cholesterol. What do we know about anabolics? They tend to create dyslipidemia, meaning increased LDL and decreased HDL. No bueno. Once you have established coronary artery disease, then you gotta focus in on this and, and be serious. So I would not add an anabolic. If for some reason you had to, you have a wasting disorder, you're, God forbid, you get burned or something like that and you need it, then boy, you better double the dose of your statin, you know, to be smart about it. This isn't something that happens overnight, clearly. But it's something you want to be wary of, and and, and um, no, I so so um, wouldn't be my first choice, uh, even with the use of mandrolone for the joints. I would be very cautious. The problem with stents is how do you evaluate the stents other th other than through catheterization, recatheterization? You can't do a CT. Uh, uh, sorry, you can't do a special form of imaging because the stent blocks the view of mm. what's inside of the stent. Uh, CAT scan. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I, you know, again, please don't shoot the messenger. But since you're at this point already, no, I, I wouldn't do any anabolics. If I'm, if if you're my brother, if I'm you, I wouldn't do it. I would stick to, uh, you know, uh, just the testosterone replacement, which is shown to be actually helpful for coronary artery disease. Um, he says also here. Uh, also, I now live on an island in the Philippines. Good for you. So medical care and or medical tests, such as blood work, is extremely limited. I take a torvastatin, Lipitor, 40 milligrams, that's a hefty dose, metformin, 1,000 milligrams, 200 milligrams, Senforce, oh, which is Viagra, and Carbidolol, 6.2 milligrams, all these daily. Uh, without getting into why he's taking the Carbidolols, because he had a heart issue. Um, um, I would stay on the atorvastatin, consider coenzyme Q10 to protect yourself from the side effects of a tour of satin. Um, at least 200 milligrams, probably closer to 400 milligrams of COQ10. It's, you know, any statin is known to reduce the amount of coenzyme Q10 in your in your cells, so that's just to, to compensate. Metformin, 1,000 milligrams, again, I can't comment. I don't know why you're taking it. Anti-aging purposes are diabetic. Well, uh, certainly if you're diabetic, all the more reason to uh, be very careful, you know, to prevent any more uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, that's, a, that's definitely a comorbidity that doesn't help the situation. Viagra is actually a good one, uh, not just for the, um, uh, you know, the sexual benefits, but, uh, you know, any nitric oxide um, in the system that we can prevent the reabsorption of, obviously it works particularly for the penis, but it works in the vasculature, helps keep the, the vasculature open. So that's something you can continue to do, absolutely. Um, huh, did I miss anything with that question? I mean, again, I, I hope that's not bad news, but I hope you take it, you know, <laughs> no pun intended, to heart. It's looking out for your long-term benefit. You know, that's I mean, right. you know, unfortunately, you, are, you had this. Um, I, I think it takes anabolics off the table. All right. Thanks, Doc. So this one is another lady. Good morning, my name is Teresa. I'm hoping you can help me. I am 55, just started going through menopause. I had a brain tumor removed on September 24th, 2019, and did 27 days of radiation. Well, congratulations on getting through that. Um, 
I have arthritis in my cervical spine. I only stopped going to the gym for about a month. Right on, <laughs> champion. Uh, I was wondering if Primabolin could help with the arthritis, menopause, etc. in any way. Interesting question. This again, gotta be careful. I'm not giving medical advice, especially when we're dealing with a cancer. Um, well, she didn't say it was benign or not, but uh, anyway, talking about the brain and again, can't be given medical advice, but um, assuming that, well, I've never heard of testosterone being considered something that would cause cancer, although a metabolite of testosterone called dihydrotestosterone could further uh, extant prostate cancer. But I can't see uh, the use of testosterone or an anabolic steroid promoting a brain tumor. Uh, but I would definitely ask your oncologist, uh, even your surgical oncologist, ask everybody before you, you go on anything uh, to make sure that in their opinion, there's no chance you're gonna bring that back. And I think you would agree with me, that's probably top concern right now. Um, but you know, assuming they give it a thumbs up, um, it's not gonna help you with arthritis uh, directly. What it could help you with indirectly is supporting the musculature by building, you know, helping to build up muscle. You can't just take premium bowl and it's gonna magically make muscle and help support the spine. But the paraspinal muscles can be strengthened by doing your exercise, the appropriate exercises, eating right, sleeping right, and, um, and therefore stabilizing the area. Now, arguably, because if you go on an anabolic, even just testosterone, you're gonna start hoarding calcium. That's one of the things we know about it. So, so don't take calcium supplements unless counseled by a doctor otherwise. Uh, as a general rule, if you're gonna take an anabolic steroid or, or testosterone, um, because arthritis is excessive bone growth in a very general definition, and uh, you don't want to promote that, which you would be doing with anabolic. So, uh, but I, I would say, you know, done properly, that it would it would likely. And again, I don't have images of your cervical spine. I don't know what you're talking about when you say arthritis in, in my cervical spine. But uh, hopefully, my point is well taken. That anything you can do to stabilize the area should help decrease the promotion of more arthritis and, and maybe diminish some of the symptoms because you keep it more stable and you don't have that spur grinding, you know, and, and further reducing opposing cartilage, etc. cetera. Um, Primabolin is a great drug. Unfortunately, it is not available. It's considered contraband in the United States. So um, I know it's available elsewhere, so you'd have to go elsewhere. But this is an example where oxandrolone or Anivar would be a good second choice uh, in this country because that's it's what's legal here. But Preambolin is great because like Anivar, it's a DHT derivative, I mentioned that earlier, and um, it won't convert to excess estrogen, won't convert to estrogen at all, so it won't be promoting excess estrogen. And it's injectable. So it misses what we call, a, you know, it, the first pass of the liver is avoided, so it's a little easier in the liver, a little easier because it's a once a week injection, depending on how you're gonna use it and how frequently you decide you wanna inject it. It can be done once a week. And uh, that makes it easier too. Uh, but it is a great drug. I, I don't even know if Shearing's, Shearing used to make it yeah. uh, in yeah. Germany and then I think they had a plant in Thailand, but I don't think that's even there anymore. I don't know where you could get it anymore, but... Um, I think she mentioned it because of the safety. So I think she, there's part of a concern. Since she's a lady, she's probably concerned about the safety of Well, when it comes something. to the androgenic versus yes. anabolic side effects, yeah, right, it's, a, it's right. a beautiful one because... And yeah. that's what I meant by the, the reference to the DHC yeah. drip. Like Anabar, it's very safe for ladies because it's not considered androgenic. So yeah, yeah. it's not gonna promote those hairs on the chin, which by the way, this is a good segue to, don't forget ladies, men and women have hair in the same places, women just a lot less of it typically. So, and, and you know, we always judge by, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, it must happen later in life. No, it happens, you know, sometimes late 20s, early 30s. It's just, you know, if you noticed on grandma, she was plucking them because she cared. And then at 70, they crop up because she doesn't care anymore. <laughs> you know what? I've lived a long life. I don't care what you think about it because everyone gets it and we all have talked about it by then. Again, it's there. Uh, but, you know, in this country anyway, we go out of our way to, you know, pluck them here if you're a female, uh, you know, shave under the arms. Although guys are doing that too now. I mean, yeah. uh, same with legs. I mean, bodybuilders, you know, not all year round necessarily, but oftentimes, yeah, all year round stay shaved. So, 
Uh, but just as a reminder, we have <laughs> hair in the same place as just women typically less. Than. So uh, the idea is, even though it's a dihydrotestosterone derivative, dihydrotestosterone will promote that unwanted hair growth typically. Uh, as a derivative, it doesn't. Even though it's close, it still doesn't. And in fact, it's, it's as I said, uh, much less androgenic than most anabolic steroids. And so there's less of a worry there for the females that that's going to be a result, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Doc. This one this time says, Dear Doctor, oh, when we have a female question once again. I love it. A three. My name is Sarah from the UK. Welcome, Sarah from the UK. I've been watching your Ask the Doc on YouTube and wanted to ask a question. I hope you can help with a query I have about Anavar and beginners. Uh, I'm a 52-year-old woman, 5 foot 5 inches, and weigh 51 kilograms. So 110, 120? 112, roughly 112 pounds, right? I've been training for about a year and taking whey protein and creatine. However, I seem to have plateaued with my muscle gain. Someone had mentioned Anabar to me as the safest, she puts in quotes, anabolic steroid with the least side effects. Wow, this is coming up often. Um, well, I hope this isn't repetitive, but I'll do my best to not make it boring. Um, obviously, I don't want to turn androgenic, but I'd like to improve my physique. I don't want massive muscle gain, nor do I need huge fat loss. Therefore, my question is, if I take Anabar for eight weeks at either five or 10 milligrams a day, not sure what is the correct dosage. Will I see results and better muscle definition and growth? And will I do myself any long-term damage? Many thanks, anticipating your reply, regards. Well, she don't even need you. <laughs> well, she already, yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, this gives me a little bit of chance to, I guess, reinforce some of the, the, the details, which is, yeah, I, you know, again, without knowing your situation and without giving you, you know, direct medical advice, uh, given that everything else is, is, you know, we'll call it normal, my general reply would be, yeah, Anamar is a good choice for women for the reasons that you mentioned. You know, very little chance of having any androgenic side effects. The male secondary sex characteristics that include hair, you know, on your back in the wrong places and, and, and losing hair in the right places on your head. Uh, acne, all those can be side effects of some of the other, not only anabolic steroids, but testosterone itself, which is, you know, definitely more androgenic than is Anamar. It is one of the safest for that reason, but it's also safe in other reasons. Um, there are other side effects um, that you're avoiding. You know, the only downside to um, Anabar that I can think of, you know, relative to the others, this isn't oral. You know, practically speaking, that's kind of a pain in the butt to have to remember to take pills. I mean, that's a, that's a given. But again, your liver has to do a little bit more work than if it were an injectable. Uh, but the dosage is so small, and yes, Five milligrams is a probably a little light, especially for most athletes, but try uh, five milligrams twice a day and see if, uh, you know, assuming your doctor will prescribe it, but see if that doesn't give you the results you're looking for. The beauty of Anavar is it's not a huge muscle gainer. It's not extremely anabolic. You know, decadroblin, or also known as nandrolone, is a drug that you can use for wasting disorders, particularly, uh, where you can put on 40 pounds. I know. 40 pounds in a, in a 10 week, what we call cycle, a period where you're using that nandrolone with just 200 milligrams per week, along with sufficient caloric intake, sufficient rest and, and training. Um, but Anavar is not for something like that. Anavar is for just what you're talking about. Hey, uh, for a guy, I'll oh, forget about for a guy. Let's talk about the ladies. For a lady who says, you know what, I'd like to put on maybe three, four pounds of muscle. Why would you want to do that? You know, other than the obvious, functionality, you know, more of tone, you know, what we call muscle tone visually, not necessarily literally or physiologically. Uh, if you don't have any tone, you're dead. But, you know, what people call tone, a little more muscularity. Uh, three or four pounds of muscle for, um, you know, uh, a gal this height, you know, and reducing, say, the equivalent in fat. And if you remember that, you know, five pounds of fat roughly represents a, a loaf of bread, that's a pretty significant change, but what mm -hmm. have you really changed? In my example, you haven't changed your weight at all. Just body composition. Right, but body composition has changed a lot. And that's what most people want to do. They don't have to get a whole new wardrobe. I say most people. I'm not talking about 20 year olds. I'm talking about, you know, the let's call them the, the 30 and ups, all right? Um, so it sounds like it would fit your needs very, very well. And, uh, you know, for, for, for 
what you say, you don't want a big muscle gain, you don't need a huge fat loss. Eight weeks is a little short. Oh. Go for eight weeks, but know that you could probably go really indefinitely for a female uh, because it's not risky like it would be. If, I say risky. It's not the right word. It's not as detrimental. You don't have as many side effects like you would with the dose you'd have to use for a guy. Again, the effect on the lipid profile, the cholesterol, and the potential effect on the liver, which, by the way, I've, I've yet to ever see. I think that a lot of the evaluations of oral anabolics use just AST and ALT, and I've already explained why that, I think, has been a mistake, if that's the case. I can't prove it, but in what I've seen in practice for a long time, um, because I get a GGT, I can tease out an elevation in AST and ALT that might be from the liver overworking, if you will, really just doing its job, but working more than we want it to work, and uh, excess muscle tissue breakdown which again can elevate the AST and ALT. Because you get that GGT, you can say, wait a minute, this clearly with the GGT in a single digit certainly, it means that uh, you know, it wasn't a result of liver tissue breakdown, it's because of muscle tissue breakdown. So uh, again, to her point, very, very safe. Um, and uh, I was just gonna say, um, uh, because it's a female dose, as we call it such a small dose, you could do it indefinitely, but you know, might wanna go for as much as 12 weeks, and that just has to do with you know, practically speaking, that might be how long it takes before you see a significant enough uh, change here. Um, although it can happen pretty quickly. I tell people, give it at least six weeks before you even start the clock running. Right. Um, that has to do with uh, really reasons we don't know because the titer of testosterone or the titer of andro in this case will go up as soon as you take it. But it doesn't start to, as we say, kick in and you don't start to feel the energetic effects and see the muscle growth for quite a bit of time. I think it's quite a bit of time, six weeks. Sometimes the orals, and particularly anabolic orals, might kick in you know, in four weeks, but I'd rather under-promise and over-deliver. So give it at least six weeks, and then you are, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna enjoy that for two weeks? I doubt it. You're probably gonna wanna stretch that out for 12 weeks is my point. So I'm just getting just started. <laughs> set, set in your head, you might wanna go 12 weeks yeah. or further. But yeah, I'd love to hear back to see if you do find a doctor to prescribe it for you in the UK and you do uh, you know, go for it, you know, how it works for you. Send pictures. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> just joking. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. Hi, Dave and Dr. McLean. I have watched your videos and always learned from them. I have some questions about DIM, methane, which you have mentioned a few times now in connection with controlling potentially harmful types of estrogens. I have tried to do research on the internet. Always a tricky pro proposition, I agree. And have gotten, even for doctors, <laughs> and have gotten a little confused. I don't blame you. <laughs> Some people say that DIM will reduce, and I think he means uh, aromatization. Maybe he's an accountant or a businessman. He writes amortization, which I can appreciate being uh, formerly being a CPA, of testosterone, which I think would be good for increasing test levels and decreasing estradiol. Others say that it is itself an estrogen or has estrogenic activity, which I think might tilt the balance back the other way. And very few speak of the to the question of controlling other estrogens. Just the question is confusing, yeah, and, and for good reason, and I'll address that in a second. For reference, I'm an older, quote, he puts, a man, and had a blood test a year ago or so for testosterone. 351 nanograms per milliliter total and free of 5.6 picograms per milliliter, I'm assuming. Both on the low side, yep. I believe especially the free, yes. So I have a few questions which I hope you can discuss. Question one, does DIM in fact reduce aromatization of testosterone into estradiol and would it therefore be good for a low T man? Would any effect be significant? Great question. DIM, first of all, we gotta back up. Is it DIM or I3C, um, indole 3 carbonyl, which does the yeoman's work here? That's an argument in and of itself. If you go on and look at the research, um, I3C is what's found in the brassica family of vegetables, like uh, broccoli, uh, cruciferous vegetables we call them, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, Brussels sprouts, some mustard greens. Actually, there's a whole lot of, even red wine, uh, substances that include uh, uh, I3C and or DIM. But I3C typically gets converted very rapidly in stomach acid to DIM. Um, I3C, though, also gets converted to other 
substances that we think are beneficial, actually we know some of them have already been proven to be, for example, anti-carcinogenic. So, do you want to use DIM or I3C? Does it matter? Do you want to use both? This is where it gets pretty convoluted and I understand the confusion uh, it, it, because there are conflicting studies because the interpretation of the results of these studies makes it difficult to to come up with an easy answer. Uh, for me at that point, I usually side on what Mother Nature provides us first. Um, but if you don't like broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts, you're kind of up a creek, right, without a paddle. <laughs> so then you go to supplements. Um, I would suggest using either one or both. Maybe use a month of DIM, another month of I3C and play it safe in that regard. I think either one, from what we know today, is safe and good for you. We have studies, for example, showing that the methane works for certain uh, estrogen receptors of the prostate. That seems like a good enough reason for a guy, anyway, to, to, to supplement that in his diet, um, even if he's not using I3C or chooses not to. So uh, I guess bottom line without getting too deep in the weeds here is I would use either one. Um, you can use both in a dosage. DIM is 100 milligrams if you're going to use um, you know, an, a, an exogenous source of supplement. I don't, I can, I'm sorry, I don't, I can't give you an I3C dose, but there are companies making both. And, and typically, if anything, they overshoot, I found, uh, excuse me, they, they overshoot, I found, rather than undershoot the recommended dose. And too much, um, at least in, in, in reference to this, is not going to become a problem. In other words, if you use 200 milligrams of DIM instead of 100 milligrams, there's no reason that I see to believe that that will be too much. Um, and ditto for eating too much, you know, broccoli and cauliflower, although <laughs> there are other reasons why you don't want to eat too much of that. Uh, he asks also, um, oh, so let me finish though. She's, does it reduce the, the aromatization? I, th I think, well, let me just answer it the way I can get a fact across, which does it affect aromatization? In other words, will it help block aromatization of testosterone and estrogen? Yes, but to... His last question, would any effect be significant? I would argue, I would say, are you no? Compared to an AI, or better put, perhaps, instead of an AI, no. You'd have to take so much DM, DIM or I3C. I've never seen it work. But does it do that in the body? Yes. So it works to, um, uh, to block the conversion, yes, um, of testosterone and estrogen. But I think more importantly... I recommend it to block the conversion of certain estrogens to certain other estrogens. In other words, good estrogens to bad estrogens. I think that's a more important purpose of I3C or DIM. So he says, uh, does DIM also act as an estrogen? And if so, does this counteract any improvement in T? Um, does it act as an estrogen? Not that I'm aware of. Again, it's going to block the conversion, so it's not fitting in an estrogen receptor. Uh, but let me reserve, I, I, that caught me off guard because I, I don't even know why. I guess I, you, know, you can ask any question, and there are no such thing as a stupid question, but uh, it doesn't fit with the chemistry that I'm aware of. I don't know why it would act as an estrogen in any way. If anything, it would, it would act to, as I said, uh, block an increase in estrogen through the aromatase. But uh, can you explain the issues with the less desirable estrogens. Yes, estradiol, for example, which we believe now generally that uh, is, is neutral at best and probably at worst in some ways pro-carcinogenic. Uh, estriol, to the contrary, we think at worst is neutral and at best uh, anti-carcinogenic. Uh, no, that makes me think that I say estradiol is at worst pro-carcinogenic. I hope I said it right the, the, the first time. Um, but there are things, estrogens, that can be made from, for example, estradiol, which we know are bad. There is um, a four and more popular, more well-known, a 16, uh, I believe it's a 16 alpha estrone that we know is terrible. They even have a test called a 216 alpha hydroxy estrone test to determine the relationship of good and bad. And so, um, uh, taking the DIM or I3C we know can block that conversion 
from the good to the bad. Uh, so that's, I hope, answering, that's the only question he asked about that. Um, he says, I do recall, I think that they are implicated in some way with prostate cancer in some individuals. I touched on that earlier. Yes, um, absolutely, there are, um, what we refer to as, as, you know, 17 beta, or we refer to it as estradiol, just in general. That's linked. There are receptors in the prostate that we know. I believe there's some estrone receptors as well. And again, I just touched on those. And yes, the DIM will help to block those from being agonized. And, and that's obviously very important for guys. Uh, what would be a reasonable use of DIM and in what dose range? Okay, again, 100 milligrams at a minimum. You go up to 200, it's not going to harm you, more than likely. Recognizing that this is just a general dietary supplement question, not a medical treatment one. I don't know what you mean by that, but I mean, I prescribe, if you will, DIM all the time, or I3C. Why not? I mean, this is, I'm not sure what, what point you're trying to make, but yeah, it's a supplement, meaning you don't have to have a prescription for it, but it, it's part of medical care. I would argue, guys and gals, take your DIM or I3C uh, if you don't like your veggies, at least eat plenty of these vegetables because there are definitely, even if it's just addressing the xenoestrogens out there, the, 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 the chemicals out there that, are, that resemble bad estrogens, to protect yourself. Um, guys and girls should both be eating plenty of cruciferous vegetables to get enough DIM and, uh, and I3C to protect themselves. It's, 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 you know, the Chinese call them superior herbs when they're not used to necessarily treat anything. They're, they're used to, uh, you know, just on a daily basis to, to better optimize health. This is one of those supplements. Nice. Thanks, Doc. Sure.